Well, do turn with me this morning in your Bibles to 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, please. So 1 Peter chapter 2, and as we go back to our series on worship, and uh, I trust the Lord has been speaking to us and challenging us through these different messages, we're going to go back to that theme of, of preaching. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, I, I sought to show you from the life of our Lord Jesus Christ and from his own words and his own conduct, the importance for preaching and preaching the Word of God. Well, this morning as we come to the Word, and I trust this will be of help to all of us here, I want us to think about hearing the Word as it's preached, hearing the Word. How do we listen? How do we hear the Word of God as it is preached to us? And for this, we want to read from 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'm going to read uh, with you, please, uh, from verse 1. I'll read through to verse 10. But we're only going to be looking at verses 1 to 3 especially. So 1 Peter chapter 2, we're thinking about the need to hear the word of God as it's preached. And I want us to read from 1 Peter 2 and verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies or and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively or living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Mercy. Amen. God will bless the reading of his precious and his holy word uh, to all of our hearts. Let's just bow in prayer again, please, uh, dear brethren and sisters and all who are with us here in our congregation. And let's seek the Lord together. And uh, you pray for your own soul and I'll pray for for help to preach the word. And may the Lord draw near to us and give us great help around the truth of God. Father, we thank thee this day for our health and our strength that finds us here in thy house. And then the open book and the freedoms that we enjoy and that we're not uh, banned from assembling to worship and we don't have the fear of persecution hovering over our heads. Lord, we can be here as long as we wish to, to hear the preaching of thy word, all that we might love it and give ourselves to it and help us, Father, to know it and to have the application of it to our souls. And I pray that you'll draw near to everyone this day and that you'll comfort them and encourage them and edify, and challenge, and exhort us, and rebuke us, and whatever is needed. Lord, may we be willing to be just given into the hands of God, the one who is the wise potter. And we say, Father, we are the clay. We are the clay. Mold us, and make us after thy will. Fill me now with thy spirit, Lord, and give me help, Father, to preach only thy word. I ask these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Now, remember a couple of weeks ago, we, as I've mentioned, we, we looked at how the Savior emphasized and, and he made it very clear about the importance of preaching the word of God. He goes into the, the Jewish temple. Remember, he goes into the synagogue and he's given the, the, the Old Testament scriptures to read. It's from Isaiah and he reads the word of God and then he sits down and he applies the word of God. And that word has a tremendous impact upon the people. And it's not the impact that maybe everyone would expect and anticipate. Remember how many 
uh, were willing to throw him over the edge. But nonetheless, our Saviour demonstrates the, the, the central need for the reading and for the preaching of the Word of God when it comes to worship. Now, you could go to many places in our Saviour's life to underline that again and again and again. You think of Mark's Gospel, and I believe it's in chapter 1, and when the Saviour uh, embarks upon what we call his, his earthly ministry, what is it that Jesus first preaches? It's repent and believe the Gospel. So the Saviour very clearly shows us the importance of the preaching of God's Word. And I trust that's something that we all uh, believe and we all accept and we all embrace with our hearts. But the Saviour does something else throughout his earthly ministry. And on different occasions, the Lord Jesus would speak to disciples and he would speak to apostles and he would speak to those that would hear him. And he also made it very clear that what we hear and how we hear the Word of God is very important as well. In fact, he attached warnings to this. For example, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 8 and verse 18, listen to the words of our Lord Jesus. He uses that little phrase, take heed. It's not really a phrase that we use in our own day and age, but we know what it means. There's a warning attached to that. There is a reminder that we all have a responsibility. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. And then in Mark chapter 4 and verse 24, it's a very similar type of warning with a slight difference. And the Lord Jesus on that occasion says, take heed what ye hear. And so very clearly our Savior emphasized. And as he preached the word of God, not only by his own example, but by his words, he says, listen, it's very important what you listen to, and it's very important how you listen to the Word of God. And so it's quite natural as we think about our worship uh, week after week, whether it's private worship in our homes as Christians, or whether it's a collective worship as we do here in church week after week, that we understand that one of the, the, the most important aspects of, of how we engage you know, we might say what our part is in the worship of God is how we listen, how we take in the word of God, what we do with the scriptures and the word as it's given to us time and time again. Now, I believe this works both ways, and I'm very much mindful of that. And so as a minister of God's word, I have a, a very fearful and a very solemn responsibility to provide something to you. And that responsibility is given to me in Scripture. That responsibility is to provide a Christ-centered ministry. A Christ-centered ministry. To preach Him day and night to all men and women. It is an all-round ministry in which the Word of God is taught from beginning to end. And if you read the words of Paul to Timothy... It's a word often I say to myself, and I know many uh, ministers of the gospel will always be challenged by the words of Paul to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, he says, Timothy, preach the word. But Paul didn't stop there. He said, Timothy, preach the word in season and preach the word out of season. In other words, what you do, do it all the time. Do it in every circumstance. Do it in all situations. Do it in the good times and the bad times. And then Paul goes on to say something else to Timothy. Paul says, Timothy, preach the word in all seasons. And then Timothy, do something else. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering or patience and doctrine. Timothy, you're to be all round in the ministry and you're to be in season and almost out of season in the ministry. This is what you are to do. Why? Why, Timothy? And if you read 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, he makes it clear because he says, Timothy, the time will come when there will be those that do not want this. They do not want this. And, and, and all the more the reason to bring it before men and women. And I think our day and age in which we live, I think sort of widely spoken in terms of the, the Western civilization or the picture of the Christian church is something which we should remind ourselves of, that we live in these types of days. 
And so the responsibility of the preacher is to do this very thing and to do it fearfully before the face of God. But then there's also responsibility for us who sit to listen to the word of God. And of course, you know, I, that's something that, that I myself know, know much about. I've, I, I sit there on occasions and I hear preachers preach and, and, and it's wonderful to, to listen to men of God preach the word of God. But it reminds me even of this, this challenge. How do you hear the word? What's the preparation that you need to listen to the sermon? Jesus has said, you've got to take heed what you listen to. You've got to be discerning as to what comes into your ears and what comes out of the pulpit. I'm not just take it in on any given occasion, but then you've got to remind yourself, how do I listen to it? How, how is this going to be blessed to my soul? And it's a, it's a wonderful, challenging message, and I trust it'll be comforting at the same time. Because right here in 1 Peter 2, we have great instruction. Now, there are many places we could turn to, but I think Peter's words is ideal in teaching us how we listen to the Word of God. And that's the message very simply this morning in God's house. How we listen and how we hear the Word of God. Well, first of all, let's remember this. We hear the Word of God by remembering what we are. You see, when we come to listen to the, the, the Word of God, or whether it's our own private readings of Holy Scripture, because it's not just, you know, uh, isolated to a one-off occasion on a Sunday, but every day as we read the Bible for ourselves, we have to remind ourselves of, of what we are. And Peter says, as newborn babes. Now, he has a reason why he's going to use that picture, and we'll get there very soon. But just remember this one thing, that when we sit here in the house of God, we, we certainly differ one from the other, but the great difference is this, we are either the children of God or we're not. And that's a very clear and simple thing to understand. In the worship of God, and our Lord Jesus Christ made this clear when he gave that parable of the sower. Remember the parable of the sower? And he gave four grounds, didn't he? And of the four grounds which he gave, only one ground brought forth the fruit which was pleasing in the eyes. The other ground was stony. The other ground was a wayside hearer. The other ground, the thorns choked it. And, and so it seems that when the seed is being sown and the, and the word is being preached, that, that sometimes, often it's often the case, I must say, that it's only the few that bring forth that genuine fruit which is pleasing in the eyes of God. That's a challenge in its own sense. But it reminds us that when we think of the local church, we're made up of many differences. We have adults and we have children here this morning. And we have those who have needs. You have physical needs, and many of you do. And some who can't be here, they have them. And you've got emotional needs, and you've got spiritual needs. And, and there are challenges that we all face that none of us know anything about. But let me say this, our greatest difference is whether we are God's people or not. And it's the reason why I mention this is that when Peter addresses the, 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 the church here in his letter, and he says, as newborn babes, he is not talking to every single person. He's talking to those of us who are Christians. And he says, when you listen to the Bible being preached and the word coming from the pulpit, or you read your Bible for yourself, and you say, well, how do I hear the word of God? Here's the starting point. Remember what you are. You're the children of God. And you're newborn babes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wonder, how's that been the experience? And is that true of you? And as you take your seats and you listen to the preaching and you take up your hymn books, can you say as you stand before God, I am born of the Spirit. I'm infilled by the Spirit. I love his word. I want his word. I desire the things of God every day. It's, it's absolutely vital that we answer that question and we can say, yes, I'm a newborn babe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you do that, you've got a tremendous starting point by which you'll able to receive the word of God and drink it into your souls. Furthermore, note in the previous chapter, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22 and verse 23, that notice that Paul makes this point again. 
He says, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth and so forth, he says, being born again. What he means is this. If you are born again, you will do this. If you are born again by the word of God, you will be a people that love the brethren. You'll have a pure heart of love fervently. There'll be a pure soul that you have. Why? Because you are a child of God. And that has to be the starting point when it comes to hearing and receiving the word. So then how do we then prepare ourselves as the children of God to listen to scripture? Well, Peter instructs them here very clearly in verse 1 as to necessary preparation to receive the word. Those of you that, that work in you know, aspects of life where there is a need to prepare uh, for something else, maybe preparing the ground for its seed, maybe having to prepare a, a, a computer for a day's work, preparing a, your diary for the week ahead. We, we live in days where in order to do one thing, we have to do something first. And that's what Peter is dealing with here in this particular passage when he instructs them and what he instructs them to do as the children of God is challenging and very direct. He says, wherefore, in verse 1, Lay aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisies, evils, uh, envies, and evil speakings, and as newborn babes, okay? I, I see here a picture. I see almost a crowded room. And if we have crowded homes and crowded rooms, we know if we want to put more into the homes, you've got to get rid of things. And that's true of our lives, isn't it, as Christians? If we are to receive the word to our souls, if we are to be blessed by the word of the living God, there, there cannot be any place for these things in our lives. And so Peter says, Christian, and he talks to a church here. Now remember something, the church or the people that he was writing to in First Peter, they were to be commended for many things. They were a godly example in many areas of life. I don't have all the time to go into the details, but when he writes to Christians in 1 Peter, they suffered by way of persecution and troubles and difficulties, and they showed great courage in the face of all these things. But they were not perfect. They were far from perfect, reminding us of every church. And Peter has his finger upon the pulse, and he says, the one thing that you need to make sure of is that as those who are born again, there's no place for hypocrisy, there's no place for evil speaking, there's no place for envy, there's no place for malice, there's no place for any of these things, because it's not compatible with the gospel. We'll remain hungry, we'll remain needy, if we live and we act in these ways as God's people. And so whether preaching or hearing, whether it's me or whether it's you, we come before the message and it's a prepared heart that we need. And you say, well, how do I do that then as I come to church every Sunday or I pick up the Bible for myself? Well, the, the very simple thing is to go to God and do what David says and say, Lord, search me and know me and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It is as God's children who have hearts that are clear and emptied of all the things of the world, the affections and the love for the world. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe our hearts are just bound full of love for this world and the things of this world, that there's no place for this book. And there's no place for his truth. We must receive the word of God as the children of God, as newborn babes. Well, then we must also hear the word not only by remembering what we are, we're the children of God, but then by desiring what we need. By desiring what we need. Notice what Peter says in verse 2. So he says, you lay aside all of these things. And as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. The word desire means long. It means crave. Uh, I'm trying to think of some examples. So Romans 1, verse 11, Paul said this to the church. He says, I long to see you. And he did. I long to see you. He longed to see God's people. He desired to see them. He craved to see them. 
So Peter, and this is very challenging to my soul this morning, he doesn't say as newborn babes, take an interest in the Bible or the Word of God, okay? He doesn't say as Christians and newborn babes, show some type of uh, inclination to, to hear the Word of God. No, no. Listen, he says, as newborn babes crave, long, hunger, thirst, desire, if you think of that psalm, pant after God. Well, I asked that to my own soul, and immediately I'm exposed. Is that my experience as a Christian? Do I crave God's word day after day after day? The Christian's longing as it's expressed is this, to desire the word of God. Now, the picture he uses is familiar to all of us. Uh, most of us, I think, I might say all of us are past the stage of the, new, of, the, of the newborn babe. Some of us have little children. Some of us have children growing up. So, and, and many of you can think back to those days when your sons and your daughters were, were newly born. And, you know, you, you, you hit that stage, don't you, where they cry and they cry and they cry. And a baby will cry for all sorts of different reasons. They will cry because they want warmth. They will cry because they want attention. They, they cry because they want a cuddle. But more often than not, or they'll cry because they need changed. And maybe their dads here didn't know a great, a great deal of changing the baby. But the most important thing is this. They cry because they want food. They want milk. They want something so simple, but so important to their life. And, and it, of all the things that, that Peter could use to illustrate the Christian's longing is this most simple and this most, you might say, innocent of illustrations, the newborn baby crying for food. Feed me. And that child can't speak words. And that little baby can't put words into its mouth. But it can cry. And it will keep on crying until it gets its milk and is satisfied. You know, in fact, we're all concerned, aren't we? Parents of you and grandparents or maybe uh, guardians or teachers or just people within the church that have an interest in little ones. Maybe we hear news of a little baby that's recently born and they're not feeding. They're, they're not feeding as they should. They're not having the amounts that maybe is, is recommended for them. Or maybe they stop feeding altogether. And then we start becoming alarmed, don't we? And we ask the questions, what's wrong with the child? What's wrong with the baby? Why, why are they not feeding anymore? Why don't they feed like other children? And we spend all of our days and our hours and our moments and we're worried and we're concerned. They're not like other babies. They're not feeding. What is wrong? But we seem content. We seem content as Christians to show no concern and no alarm if we have no desire for the word. We write it off just the way it is. Peter says, desire it. Crave the word of God. Have an intense desire for it. Listen to David in Psalm 119, verse 97. And he says, oh, how I love. Oh, how I love thy law. He says, Lord, I love your word. And I love its truth. And I love its teachings. And he says, it's my meditation all the day. And you say, well, that was David. He, you know, he, he was different from us. No, no, he wasn't. He, he wasn't different because he sinned and he had temptations and he fell and he, and he had setbacks and he had problems with his home. And he was a king and, he, and he, he had empires to deal with. But he loved the word. And he desired it and he longed for it every single day. You know, one of the great descriptions of the church of Jesus Christ is in Acts 2 and verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word. They didn't just receive it, it was, it was a glad receiving of the word. They were baptized. When uh, Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica, he rejoiced over them because he says, uh, when you received the word of God, you did not receive it as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. And that thrilled Paul's soul because they, they took the word to their souls because they realized this is God's word. It, it matters. It means something. This is my marrow, my strength, my meat, my food. It's, it's everything that we need. Is it the case that today the Christian church is blighted? 
I think it is, personally. Blighted, because all throughout the week, we have no longings, no desires for the book, for the word, for the truth. And we fill our lives with absolutely everything else, poor, poor substitutes that can never satisfy us. And so we, I have to challenge me, before I say it to you, and the Lord has searched me out on this matter, do I desire his word? I long for it all of my days. And if you can say yes, what a, what a wonderful thing. And if you say no, then there's something wrong, Christian. Or maybe we're not Christians in the first place. But we don't have to stop there. You can get before God and say, Lord, give me that desire. Teach me to love your truth. Break the bread of life to me every single day. So the Christian's longing as it's expressed, but the Christian's longing as it's satisfied. Because Peter says here that as newborn babes, they desire the sincere milk of the word. I know that when parents get to their stage, you know, there's that sort of air of excitement when they, you know, you've sort of got fed up with milk and you, you want to give them a bit of steak or a bit of beef or chicken or something on those lines. And you start looking online for these strange recipes, mixing peach of chicken. That's one of the things we had to do many years ago. And, you, and you, when can I give them the solids? Give them the, the finger food and all the excitement when that happens. But the beginning is this, milk. The sincere milk of the word. Now, what does sincere mean? To the, the boys and girls who are here especially, because you might not understand what that means. Sincere milk of the word. It just simply means, boys and girls, pure milk. Or it means unmixed milk. It's just simple milk. It is what it is, a spade being a spade, we might say. Not added to and certainly not taken away from. And, and isn't it fascinating to think that no matter the, the mother, the culture, the country, the language, the, the circumstances, it's milk. It's what God has given. We might say by nature, and it's what God gives by nature to the church. He says, what you need is this. And you say, Lord, I need many things. No, to hear the word of God and to benefit from the word of God and to be blessed from the word of God. There must be the joining together of two things, a passionate longing and a desire for the pure milk of the word of God. And that's it. And that really is it. And so the Christian, irrespective of how many years saved, must examine our lives and in coming to worship, we ask the questions, do we desire something else? Do you want something else? Because God gives us such a clear message about hearing the word and how we hear it. You desire it. And, and it's this, it's the book alone. It's all that we need. And in a sense, it's all that we have. And oh, God is able to break it and to bless it to our souls time and time again. And let me say this. It's the best remedy for all your needs. What troubles do you have this morning, Christian? What worries do you have? You've taken your seat in God's house and there's something fearful in your mind. It's anxiety, it's trouble, it's doubts. Maybe it's something which is breaking you before the face of God in prayer. The best remedy for all your worries and concerns is the constant stream to God's truth. And that's why I would say, I know not everyone does this or maybe want to do this, but I would encourage you to do this, that when you're in your cars and you're going on a journey, listen to sound preaching. Download messages. You know the resources that we have online are incredible. The messages at our fingertips, even just the Bible being read, turn off the, the things which really benefit you in no way and expose yourself. And you say, well, will that help me? It will. Because it increases the appetite, doesn't it? You think of those times when you've been very sick. I remember one time I had a terrible stomach bug and it went on for, for over a week and I was in the hospital with it as a child. And I remember going back to the, to the house and my mum, uh, probably listening to this because she watches online so she'll have to forgive me this one here. Um, she, she offered me uh, chocolate bourbon biscuits as a, as a remedy for feeling sick. And, uh, and then people were coming with other sorts of things, and I had no appetite for these things. But it was only when it was just that little bit of toast, it was something dry, it was something small, and then it just leads to a 
bigger appetite and more and more. And, and that's how we hear the word. Taking these small pieces, hearing a message here and there, saturating our lives with God and the things of God. And before you know it, you want more and more. And you hear the word and you rejoice in it and you're glad. And he says, what do you desire, Christian? What do you crave for? Answer the question, what do you long for? The sincere, pure, unmixed word of God. The building blocks of all of our spiritual life. I came across a quote this week by the Puritan Thomas Manton online and it really spoke to me. And he said this, the church is like a river. If it gets wider instead of deeper, it will lose its power. Well, we're very wide. We're not so powerful. And maybe the depth that we need is a depth which is only provided by a longing and a craving for the word of God. And it only is that which will satisfy us. And Peter says something really important, Christian. Look at your Bibles. Look at the verse uh, number two. And he says, desire the unmixed, pure milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. In other words, there's no quick fixes. I know people want this. I know this. And I know there is a, a sort of a, a, a striving in people's lives. There's got to be a, you know, a quick way to blessings. There isn't. Listen, there just isn't. The, 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 the surest way to Christian growth is not a spiritual protein shake. It doesn't do anything. It just makes you feel sick. But here it is. Building your lives on the word of God. Every day, every week, every month, every year. Longing, desiring, craving. That's how we hear the word of God. And then very quickly as I finish... We hear the word of God while treasuring what we know. Notice he says in verse 3, If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now while we, we need to hear the word of God, we must desire it, I also recognize, and we all sympathize together today, that certainly it isn't easy. It's not easy on your own, and it's not easy in the place of worship. And on your own, there's distractions, aren't they? You open the Bible, your, your phone goes. You go to pray, the door knocks. You go to listen to a message, something pops into your mind. There's always something when you're alone, isn't there? Aren't we all the same? And then there's the problems in church. We come into the house of God and we're distracted, don't we? The light flickers and we're there for 15 minutes. Why is the light flickering? Something blows outside, there's a noise. We look to one side, we're looking left and right. We're wondering who is here, who is not here. You come with your battles, your struggles. And in that moment, Satan seizes an advantage and takes advantage. And we're, we're all the poorer for these interruptions and these, 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 these areas in which we are easily distracted. Now, there are many practical things I could say. I don't have time to mention them. Some of you take notes. Some of you don't. It's not, it's not a requirement in the Bible, but some do. That, that helps them to concentrate. If you know what the message is beforehand, it's good to read maybe beforehand. If you maybe know what I'm going to preach on, that's not always the case, but if you can. And then, then something else. Even during a message, you can pray. I, I've done that myself, and I've sat there, and I've found it really hard going. And I've said, Lord, help me. This is your word to take it in. I do it even as I preach, believe it or not. Lord, give me the help as I preach. Pray for, for God to speak to you through his word. So we could list many practical ways to help you hear the Bible. But Peter gives one thing here. And the one thing is really a spiritual help. He says, if so be. Now what he means by that little phrase, if so be, is this. Since you have. He's, in other words, he's not putting doubt upon it. He's not saying, well, you know, desire the word of God because maybe or maybe you're not your Christian. It's, it's more like this. Because you are a child of God and because you have tasted how good and gracious the Lord is, because you've had the appetizer and the starter, long and crave for more and for more. I don't know if it's still a a practice in supermarkets today, sometimes I see it in supermarkets or delis where, you know, people go around with that little tray of, of you know, tasters, you know, a little block of cheese, 
or sort of a bit of weirdly cut pork pie or something. And, you know, they, they want to make you buy the product by giving you a little taste. And sometimes look at it and think that the appetizer doesn't look too great. <laughs> don't want to try the whole thing. That, that illustration is, is something which reminds us here. If you are a Christian, you have received a taste of Christ. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby because you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. That's what he's saying here. Do you not as a Christian already know the Savior? Do you not have an acquaintance with him? Have you not been saved and forgiven? Do you not know the peace of God? Then why do you not long for him and desire him and want him more and more and want his word and nothing else? That's a challenge, isn't it? Because the challenge is this, that the genuine Christian is known by their appetite for God and his word. The gen- Let me say this again. The genuine Christian is known by their appetite for God and his word. We might like to think a Christian is known by many other things, but primarily they are known by their appetite for God and his word. Lord, feed me. Break the bread of life to my soul. Lord, as I have tasted how good and gracious and kind and loving you are to my soul. And maybe you have to say, Lord, I've been far away from you. I've been cold and indifferent and I've lost a love for this book. But I know I'm saved and I love his word. Give me a hunger and an appetite. Let me crave and cry and long for you again in these days. And I'll say this, that when we do this, then we shall hear, hear and receive with gladness the word of God. May he bless his holy truth to all of our hearts. Amen.